namo rasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa namo rasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa namo rasa <coughs> namo rasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Buddhang damang sanggang namasami <coughs> so This is session eight of the Sutta Studies for the Rains Retreat 2023. And basically we're on the uh, Salon Samasati, uh, part three. So we've already finished three, uh, three of the four major themes for developing what I translated as attentiveness, instead of mindfulness, as attentiveness or sati. And the, uh, this fourth theme, it's a, a very important one. I guess I could say basically if you're new to Buddhism or say maybe not so intellectually inclined, at least, at least these five themes are worth studying and remembering. These are the five basic themes for Buddhist teachings, especially for the development of meditation. And they can be divided basically into two different categories. Uh, the first category is that uh, two of them, the hindrances and the seven factors of awakening, are kind of, on one, one hand, they, they are a follow-on from the previous contemplation of mind, but they also are very fundamental to the development of meditation. You can say that, you know, one simple way of putting it, Buddhist meditation is trying to put away the five hindrances and then developing the factors of awakening. That's the kind of practical application of Buddhist meditation. You know, enlightenment and all that is sort of, you know, in the background, but... <laughs> But practically, that's what we're doing, <laughs> dealing with the hindrances, trying to develop the positive or the factors of awakening qualities of the mind. And the second category, the uh, five groups of grasping and the six senses and the four noble truths, these are three of the principal themes for contemplation, especially if one is serious about reaching the cessation of suffering. The five groups of grasping and the six senses are the two primary sources of identification. Identification is the root cause of suffering. If you remember the, uh, the chanting we do every morning, eh? Jati Piduka, Jara Piduka, and it ends with, in, in short, the five groups of grasping are suffering, are dukkha, unsatisfactoriness. And the Four Noble Truths, of course, it's the, the very basis of uh, Buddhist contemplation. They say the Four Noble Truths is a, a teaching which is unique to Buddhas. Has anybody ever heard anybody else talk about dukkha? Any other religion? Mostly it's, you know, love and light rather than unsatisfactoriness, but <laughs> there is a path though too for the cessation of unsatisfactoriness. So that's, that's, the, that's the light part, <laughs> the positive part. So the first set of categories, the hindrances and the seven factors of awakening. And we start with the hindrances first. I mean, it's a, to me, it's a little bit of a, not a very satisfying name, hindrances, because I think most people, when you hear hindrances, get rid of it, right? But it's not so easy when it comes to practice. Basically, if you just try and get rid of the hindrances, that's also a hindrance. One of the hindrances is aversion to the hindrances. So you get stuck in it. And uh, in, in a way, they are, the hindrances are fundamental aspects of the self. These are the, these are the basic, these are the five basic, you could say, self-defense mechanisms. Ways the self is trying to defend itself from reality, from the truth. So if you understand that, then, oh, these five hindrances have their source in the self. So if you're able to go down to their source, you find the source of the self. 
Hmm? Easy. So I think I, I would translate them as the five challenges. Yeah, on one hand, that you say, relatively speaking, or worldly speaking, they are hindrances to the development of the mind. And if you're following the previous contemplation, uh, contemplating states of mind, I mentioned there were there's 16 of them mentioned, particularly in that in that teaching. But when you begin to observe the states of mind, you might notice there's a few more too, like maybe millions of more, millions more, <laughs> a variety of. Well, they're all they're all you can say, kind of permutations of greed, aversion, delusion. You know, you say. But I think the Buddha recognizes, you know, he's trying to make this accessible to people, try and keep it simple, so at least people have an opening to it, give us some, you know, some kind of pointers or lead-ins to what a state of mind is and what to look for. So like the same with these five hindrances or challenges. I mean, uh, you know, I, for my, my meditation practice, I must admit, uh, there is probably, you know, 5,000, 50,000 hindrances, you know. <laughs> but if I started there, I wouldn't even I would give up. Oh, gosh, it's, just, it's too much, it's too much. But five, okay, that sounds reasonable. I can maybe, maybe work with five basic, you know, five basic hindrances. That's not too, too far away, you know, too impossible. But uh, I guess the, the main point is that we just, we look at those, and you can say that they are kind of the, the principal ones. They're like, they're like the, the five energetics, basic energetics of your mind. The greed is reaching out. The ill will is pushing away. The, the, uh, sleepy, the lethargy and sleepiness is kind of collapse. And the restlessness and worry is dispersion. And then doubt is paralysis. These are kind of the five basic energies of the mind, the way the mind, say, uh, throws up obstacles or hindrances in your way. So just putting it down to those five. And then if you do notice some other kind of hindrance come up, you can probably also put it into those categories. You know, like a, a common one is maybe fear. Fear comes up, you know. Fear is, I would say, a kind of a paralysis energy. So I would put it under doubt. I mean, we, we're afraid, but we don't know. Yeah. So then, okay, it's not mentioned exactly as a, as a hindrance, but, you know, it is, it is a hindrance maybe you come across, and it's got that kind of energetic, so you can treat it just like doubt. So these five particular energies or challenges... The uh, Buddha points out, to, out, you know, ways to deal with them. First of all, you have to know them, know what these are. I mean, that's, you say, it's kind of like a, a result of the work we've done already. Uh, contemplation of the body, bodily sensations, the feelings, the states of mind. And then you, if you understand those principles, then when you come across these so-called hindrances, oh, right, I recognize them. Yeah. And uh, you can, or if it's hard to recognize them, always go back, say, for example, to the body. You know, what's, what's the body? What's the energy in the body right now? Is it reaching out? Is it pushing away? Is it collapsed, dispersed, paralysis, whatever? Oh, if it's that kind of sensation in the body, that's an indication that it's your state of mind is that way too. So you can cross-check it. Because it's very, very important to be able to be clearly aware, right? Attentive and clearly knowing what the state of mind is in terms of these hindrances. I was uh, staying in some monastery and I think I gave a question of session, uh, session of questions and answers. And uh, somebody there was, I, just, I guess I just had finished my book on the hindrances, working with the hindrances. And so they were reading through it. And then they, they noticed that they had a lot of restlessness. So they were applying, you know, the, the Buddha gives us a whole list of ways to deal with these hindrances. So she was working through the list of how to deal with, the, with this hindrance of restlessness. 
and it didn't work. So she asked me, what's, what's the trouble? No, 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 she found out herself. She, she recognized it didn't work. So she went back again to try and investigate more clearly. What is this? You know, what's the source of this restlessness? And then she noticed it actually wasn't restlessness. It was aversion, anger, ill will. And of course, it's more frightening to look at the ill will <laughs> than the restlessness. <laughs> so the restlessness was just a, a symptom of something deeper. So unless we get down to the real, the real, you know, the real source of it, the real, the real, the real issue itself, then we can't really deal with it very skillfully. Because it's just, we're still, you know, on the surface, as it were. So we haven't got down to the source of what it really is. So it takes some, it's useful to take some time to really investigate. What is this, what is, you know, what is this manifestation of sensual desire in, the, in this particular formation of body and mind at this time? It'll be different, too. Yeah, we, we maybe we, undercover, we uncover a certain initial level of it. But then it comes out in a different form. You know, and same with, with all of the hindrances. <coughs> they express themselves differently at different, you can say, levels of practice or degrees of, of uh, attentiveness, clarity of mind. You know, so basically, we just keep working through these different levels of hindrances. And the, the I say the first exercise is to be aware of them, what they are, and then to be to notice when they're when they're present, also when they're absent. You know, just again, as you're reflecting upon the states of mind, you can reflect. Oh, what's the state of mind right now? Is there is there a state of mind which is a hindrance, for example, or is it it's absent? Oh, that's what it's it's not there now. There is no sleepiness, lethargy, and sleepiness at this moment. Watch out! It could go up, come up the next minute. Oh. <laughs> Don't be too self-satisfied yet. <laughs> Once you begin to identify, you know, observe clearly, know clearly what this hindrance is, then one contemplates how, how it, it arises. How does this hindrance arise? You know, for example, you know, one of the, the sources of lethargy and sleepiness is, is uh, excessive eating. So maybe after the meal now, two hours now, you've had the meal, maybe you're a bit of, a few people I see not, not off in some of, the, some of my talks. <laughs> don't worry, it's just one of the, you know, it's, don't take it personally. <laughs> but you recognize that, then, oh, okay, right. At least on the Sutta study day, I will not eat so much. Okay. <laughs> oh yeah, it's always, always, <clears throat> okay. <laughs> it's always a tasty food day, though. <laughs> okay. So once we've been, if we can investigate how it arises, then if it has arisen, how can it be removed? Unfortunately, you know, the Buddha gives us quite a few hints. In the scriptures, there's, there's a number of uh, techniques, skillful means, they say uh, apaya or ubai in Thai. The Buddha gives us to deal with these hindrances. And then in the future, how in the future these these uh, the, the arising of these things can be the the arising of them can be prevented in the future. So it may require us to change our habits. You know, if you do notice that you're in the habit of eating a lot at mealtime, you know, and it gives you sleepiness, well. You have to change the habit then for the benefit of you know developing uh, more energy in your practice then not being not being the slave to sleepy lethargy and sleepiness so these five hindrances i mean uh, it's helpful to know what they are just have them pointed out to us yeah like the little signposts the first one is sensual desire the second one is ill will then there's lethargy and sleepiness. There's actually seven hindrances because two of them are doubled. Lethargy and sleepiness. They say, you know, lethargy, they say, is, they say is more bodily orientated. Sleepiness is more mental, dullness of mind. Then there's restlessness and worry. 
Again, restlessness is a bit more physical, physical uh, uh, excess of energy, and worry is a bit more you know, mental. And it can be worry about things, and when somebody is worried, they generally are more restless too. Can't figure it out, they can't find an answer to it. Then there is doubt. So we're looking at the, the causes, first of all, what, what this particular, how this particular hindrance manifests. You know, some of them like doubt, maybe it's a bit more, not so, not so easy to identify, recognize, because not so much as aversion anyway, or ill will. But if you find yourself, you know, with this kind of, you know, don't know, kind of uncertain, this kind of a sense of a paralysis in your practice, which direction to go in, then it probably is in this, in this area of doubt. In the Buddha's time, doubt was very simple. Doubt was just doubting the Buddha's teachings. So with the, the solution then was to study the Buddha's teachings, make an effort, make an effort to study them. Or go to, in the Buddhist time, then you had to go to a teacher, ask them questions, because it was all done orally. Today we can look in the, in the Pali Canon, look in the books. I guess, I guess you could probably Google your question, I don't know. <laughs> if you have access to, access to the internet, you can just Google it. What did the Buddha say about, you know, of course, you know, you've got to be careful too, because sometimes you get too many answers. I found myself that it's, it's better, at least in the beginning, to try and find the answer for yourself. You know, try and search in your own mind. You know, open up this inquiry or investigation to investigate, oh, what, what, what is this doubt? What's the source of it? Rather than just you know, find the intellectual answer outside, but to find it in yourself first. You know, and if you can inquire more with more Attentiveness, objectivity, you know, the, the kind of conundrum is you, know, you want to find the answer. And that means you, you'd, like to, you'd like to have an you know, answer quickly, you know, to, to, to give you, oh, now I know, yes, okay, you can relax. But if you try too hard like that, then you get, a, you get an easy answer. <laughs> and usually isn't the right one. You have to struggle with it, the more you struggle with it, and then, ah, ha, ha, you get an eureka experience. Aha, that's it. Yeah. You've discovered it yourself, and it suits your particular temp temperament and this time and place. That's the answer for it right, right now, see. And it's more of a, an experiential response rather than just a conceptual one. What do we do to say about suffering? Okay. You can look in the book, Buddha said, you know, da, 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 da. but if you look in yourself, what's, what's the suffering here now? Uh, what's, what's the nature of this suffering? And you know, what, what's, the, uh, you know, what's its cause and what, how, it, how will it, it would cease? You know, your particular suffering right now in this particular kind, and then, ah, right, you could have a real deeper experience of it, you know, you found it yourself. So some of these are the, uh, there's definite clear solutions the Buddha gave, causes and solutions, you know, essential desire. We heard one, we, we heard one last time, well, yeah, with well, feelings, right? If somebody hasn't been able to deal skillfully with unpleasant feeling, then they cover it up with sense pleasures. Remember that? Yeah, about feeling, yeah. That was in the in the scripture there, you know, and then the, that's that's the you know kind of one particular kind of of uh, salute, uh, cause of sen of uh, se uh, sense pleasures. The other one, which is most commonly recognized, is to do with the senses. When we uh, when we have a sense impression, sense contact, you know, we usually are looking for you know a positive experience out of it, We're looking for a pleasant feeling. So they, they say that it is caused by the inappropriate attention to the sign of the beautiful. You know, in, in reality, reality is not beautiful or ugly. You know, but for most people, they look at the beautiful because it makes them feel happy or 
have pleasant feeling. So they, they look more towards the pleasant, the, the pleasant experiences. But you know, reality isn't like that. And if you keep seeing things as pleasant or look at only the pleasant things, then you desire them. You want them to hang on to them, but they're all fleeting. And then you're chasing sense pleasures and it's a, it's a false sense of, of, of pleasure then, false sense of pleasant feeling. It won't last forever. And likewise, the ill will, the cause of ill will is giving inappropriate attention to the sign of the, un, the unpleasant or the, or the unattractive things. You know, there is some kind of a distortion there. You know, there's some kind of, you're always seeing the unpleasant aspect of reality and you feel really angry and frustrated and, you know, you're irritable and, you know, the actual word is irritation. The inappropriate attention to the, to the irritating aspect of your sense impressions then. But then there's, we understand that, then we, there also is a very obvious contemplation to use. If we're always looking at, say, the pleasant side of beautiful side of reality, or sen and it arouses sense, sense desire, then we try to change our perception, try to contemplate the unattractive aspects, the asuba, unbeautiful aspects of reality. And it isn't to be careful, it's just a matter of trying to get the right balance. You know, sometimes it's translated as, you know, contemplating the, 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 uh, the uh, loathsomeness of the body, for example. Well, if you do that, then you just get more ill will. <laughs> if you see the body is loathsome, then you increase your ill will then. Didn't work, you overdone it, overshot it. But when you see the body, you can recognize the body as pleasant, you know, as beautiful, if you like, and, and not unbeautiful aspects to it. You get a more balanced perspective, balanced perception then. And then it can give rise to equanimity rather than stirring up the passions, okay? either for or against, you see. And for, if there is, has a real issue with ill will, then of course the meditation, since ill will is pushing away, meditation on friendliness allows you to come closer. You know, if you, if you practice friendliness, metta bhavana, it's a matter of opening, being receptive to, rather than pushing away, you see. And that can change your approach, change your approach to reality. Not pushing everything away, but then be more open to it. Maybe even at the beginning, maybe even kind of reaching out making an effort to be more friendly, to find out that those things are not so, not so irritating as you first thought, as the first impression was. Then of course, lethargy and sleepiness, energy, various exercises develop more energy, but also again, one needs to find the right balance because see, I think we, we heard about right energy, right effort, and if you have too much effort, we get also get, get very tense. But sometimes you have to recognize, oh, okay, I need a bit more energy here. Maybe I'll gotta relax a bit more here. You know, a different situation to find the right balance. Or being aware of life energy, as I mentioned, life force, life energy, <clears throat> rather than just willpower. And restlessness and worry, of course, it's uh, an excess of energy, maybe there's a cause to it. It could be physical, you know, there could be some physical source to it, too much coffee, <laughs> or, or there can be a mental source to it too. You know, many times when we're getting closer to seeing more clearly the nature of self, the self starts to be really restless. I noticed that one time when I was practicing in Thailand, I noticed that you know, there was a, a period when I noticed that just as my mind was getting really, really clear and quiet and calm, but, ah, breakthrough, then suddenly got really, really restless and got really, really restless and, and agitated and oof, couldn't go any further. Yeah. I think it was because the mind is getting more and more clear and it could perhaps break through and see, you know, not, no permanent self. And the self didn't want to know that, you see. So the self throws up some kind of obstacle in the way. <laughs> either push you to sleep or <laughs> send you off into worry or restlessness or even fear, fear too. 
like I say, doubt in the Buddhist time, we're just doubting the Buddhist teachings, so of course the, uh, the solution was to study the Buddhist teachings. But nowadays, you know, I think there's more sources of doubt. Uh, I think the, the main one, I think, in this modern day and age is just too much thinking. We, will want to, we, we usually think of, you know, finding a solution, but it's a conceptual solution. Conceptual answer, not an experiential one. So we, we try and think our way about it, think our way through it. I've got to find the answer, so I look at get some more information, think more about it. But it just creates more doubt because it's not, not, the, not an experiential uh, solution to doubt, it's just more concepts, shoving more concepts around. And a little bit of a more insidious one is self-doubt. These days, you know, people have a lot of self-criticism, self-disparagement. There's always somebody else who won the race, uh, somebody else who's, who's the movie star, who's the rock star, and we didn't make it, you know, so, so we're, <laughs> it's a very competitive society, you know, so there's always losers in a competitive society, and, and you know, maybe you can win for a while, you, know, you can win a few races, but you can't win them forever, see? and so we become quite self-critical just naturally uh, as a result of that. <clears throat> But, you know, the Buddha is very, had a very optimistic view of uh, human nature. You know, we're all capable of awakening. Some just take longer than others, that's all. <laughs> but the teachings are all there, step by step. You know, the more that you, the more that you practice, the, the easier it is, it becomes. Simple as that. Nobody is, is hopeless. <clears throat> Nobody is hopeless Buddhism. Some of us are just slower, that's all. <laughs> so there is hope there. <laughs> and the second one is we come to the, now the positive ones, the seven factors of awakening. And uh, <laughs> these, in, in the, some of the scriptures, if you read that chapter I mentioned, the, the Bojanga Samyutta, what is it, 30, 47 was it? 47 in the Samyutta Nikaya. Some of the suttas there, they, they mention directly that, you know, the, the hindrances and the factors of awakening go together. If you, if we, developing the factors of awakening is a direct counter to the hindrances. Some of them do work very directly. For example, one of the factors of awakening is energy. So, of course, that counters lethargy and sleepiness quite directly. You know, and the, there's, there's a, also there's a, like tranquility, direct counter to restlessness. Mm -hmm. And uh, you say, so there is some that are directly, directly influence certain particular hindrances. But in general, you know, the development of all these factors of awakening brightens up the mind. As the Buddha said, they are certain qualities of mind which we all have. But most of us haven't recognized that they are factors of awakening if they're cultivated. And some of them, of course, are, you know, they're part of a, you can say, a personal preference, but also social preferences. For example, something like tranquility. In our modern society, whoever values tranquility, eh? Look, you just go, 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 right? We have to run out there and rush, 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 and make more money and work harder and Somebody's saying, I'm practicing tranquility to think, oh, he's a bludger, right? <laughs> he's wasting his time. <laughs> Remember years ago when meditation was just being introduced, this is also like 50 years ago now. <laughs> you got to think when I say, you know, in the old days, it was a long time ago. <laughs> They used to talk about how people would be sitting there, they call them navel gazers. People who were meditating would just gaze at their navels, you see. They're sort of like you know, people who were, who were, who were uh, out of society, wasting their time. <laughs> They're just foolish. <laughs> There's even a song called The Fool on the Hill, I think, wasn't there? Before your time, probably. <laughs> There's a meditator sitting up on the hill, and he's a, the fool on the hill, you see. <laughs> so anyway, these factors of awakening, uh, 
I mean, it won't, you probably won't remember all of them, seven of them. I mentioned, I wrote them on the board there, but helpful to know again. We've already, the first one we've already quite familiar with, sati, mindfulness. And they do go sort of in a progression, you can say, because the very first one is sati, or attentiveness, that we're aware of what these factors are, how they, how they work within our, within our psyche. And then from mindfulness, from attentiveness, the second one is we, you know, we notice particular themes maybe. And then the second one is investigation of Dhamma, investigation of this theme. Investigation is, again, it should be experiential. So it says in the definition of it that one, because the word for, for investigation is vichaya, which means both, both, both investigation and discrimination. To discriminate, to, to pick apart, if you like, to look closely at. So it is defined as discriminating with Dhamma, examining it, investigating it. And the main theme to investigate, of course, which is the source of wisdom, is what is wholesome and what is unwholesome, is skillful or unskillful. Yeah, so you notice particular themes come up in, in uh, attentiveness, meditation, particular states of mind. Is this state of mind skillful or unskillful, wholesome or unwholesome? And it can be because it's called Dhamma Vichaya, that's the name of, you know, investigation of Dhamma. Dhamma has various meanings to it. The most common one is just means things or phenomena. But it also, of course, Dhamma is the Buddhist teachings. So. This wholesome and whole, unwholesome as a theme, of course, is within the context of the Buddhist teachings, some and unwholesome with regard to the Buddhist teachings, in regard to the Buddhist teachings. And then the third one from investigation of particular themes, when it becomes more clear, then a natural result is energy. Aha! You don't know, recognize that? You have sort of aha experience. Oh, right. Yeah. Attentiveness exposes it, investigation of Dhamma examines it, and it sees it more clearly. You get some clear understanding, clear knowing of it. Then energy arises. From the energy, joy arises, pity. From joy, if one can not, if one is not taken away by the joy, you know, the, you say these three factors, uh, investigation of Dhamma, energy, and joy are the energizing factors. You know, just sitting there contemplating your navel, you know, maybe falling asleep, and <laughs> when you get these positive energy, energy qualities rising, you know, joy and energy rising, the danger is that one can be, you know, get quite a bit carried away by them. You know, it's very, very, very easy to be carried away by joy, for example. So, excited, stimulated, but it can also lead to restlessness then. So then we, we, it turns into the, the calming factors then, tranquility, you know, so joy then can be balanced with tranquility, you know, calm down. The joy is, is helpful and, and, and useful, it opens up the mind, makes the mind more, more energetic and open, spacious, but needs to be calmed down too. Contained, if you like, which leads to concentration or collectedness. Also, the, you know, the calming down and the, the uh, collectedness, collecting into the, the tranquilizing, collects in the qualities, the energies of the body and the mind. You know, so it can give concentration then, which gives a clear, deep, <coughs> clear investigation. And then finally, it ends in equanimity, even mindedness. <laughs> So it, it is sort of like a progression. It is a development of meditation practice in a way, from attentiveness to investigation. This is sort of what we call insight meditation, if you like. It's not just based upon, you know, the, the mind kind of spacing out and be very peaceful, but this joy comes from understanding, from wisdom, from clear, seeing clearly. <clears throat> Once it's been uh, contained by tranquility and collectedness, and then equanimity becomes a, a common ground and 
and equanimity is the, the highest, the highest uh, the factors of the highest absorption, equanimity, which we'll come to in next theme, right, samadhi, sama samadhi. So uh, similarly as with the hindrances, one is to know when they are present or absent. One is to know how the, the, the unarisen quality, state of mind, can arise, how to cultivate tranquility, collectiveness, equanimity, for example, and how, when, once it has arisen, how it can be perfected by development. So it can become a factor of awakening then. Yeah, we, like I say, we all have these factors with us. We all have these qualities, but people haven't realized how much they can become a spiritual power, which can lead to awakening, full awakening. Not only does it, you know, are they positive qualities for living your life more wholesomely, but can actually lead to awakening, full awakening. And they should be based upon seclusion, fading away, cessation, and leading to letting go. Again, these are, you know, positive qualities, so there is a, a danger that people are identified with them, especially things like energy and joy. Very easy to identify with them be taken away by them. But based upon fading away, cessation, and leading to letting go, then that's what we call liberation and equanimity. So after those, the development of these, development of the mind, now the mind is in a very conducive state for the investigation of the nature of identification. That's where the, the next, next themes come in. The, uh, first of all, I'll talk about the uh, six senses, because that's probably most relevant or most noticeable for us anyway. And especially if you have uh, read that scripture about the, the uh, perceptual process, keep that in mind, the perceptual process, because it's helpful to read about it, because probably most of us are not able to notice it ourselves. It goes so fast. But when there is, you know, there is the, the sense organ, then there is a sense object. The two come together, they, it's called contact. And contact implies that there is knowing. You know, right now, for example, we're having all kinds of sensory impressions come our way. And your eyes are open, so there's all kinds of... But depends on what you give attention to before there is contact. When there's contact, oh, I know. I know the, the, the clock, I know the light switch, I know the, the books. Yeah. But I, maybe I didn't give attention to them before. So I just noticed the clock now, for example. <laughs> Time is ticking. <laughs> but, the, but before, it was there, it was there. Nobody, nobody just, it didn't just appear there, it was there all the time. But I didn't give conscious attention to it. There is no contact happen, no, no knowing of it. From the knowing, there is feeling. And knowing and feeling, they happen automatically. These two are, there's, there's very little uh, sense of self in it. It's just a function of the mind. The knowing and feeling just happen. Of course, at a very primal level, this feeling, maybe, maybe it's, it, doesn't even, it doesn't even feel like feeling, you'd say. It's just a matter of recognize. It's just a matter of acknowledging that it's it's uh, not it's, it's threatening or not threatening. It's okay. So you know, unpleasant things are threatening. So there's you know, it's a threat, threat is unpleasant. If it's if it's uh, we don't even know what it is yet. Just a, just a, a very vague impression. You know, it's like an instinct. It was already hardwired into our brain because otherwise it wouldn't survive if we were too late. You know, get eaten by a saber-toothed tiger already or get blown up by a clock. Or <laughs> <laughs> Maybe there's a bomb next to it. <laughs> but I recognize this clock already, so it's okay. <laughs> and then, after feeling, there is cognition or recognizing. What is this thing now? The vinyana, the knowing, doesn't even doesn't recognize what it is. It's just knowing there is something there. Yeah. And then it's cognition, 
Sanya, which recognize, oh, it's a clock. And then the next one is thinking, which the thinking is Sankara, which is, it can be all kinds of different thinking. It can be you're thinking about greed, a greedy thought, right? I like it, I want it, or I don't like it, I want to get rid of it. And then there is the elaboration around that. You know, oh, I wonder where that clock was made. And that is a clock accurate or not. And then there is what they call the, the proliferation or elaboration that just takes over. Your mind just gets spun out by it. So the first, the first stage of this knowing and feeling is very, very subject, very little subjective impression there, just automatic function of the mind. But then the sanya and the sankara, then a sense of self comes into it. We can only recognize something according to our experience. You know, if I if I if I didn't I didn't know what a what a clock was, I see that there I have no label for it. It's just some strange black thing there, you know. But because I recognize it, I know what it is. Okay, I can put it in a little, you know, format. Then it tells me what it is. And then the sankara, the thinking, tells you what to do with it, how to deal with it. You know, I, I will just leave it there, or I'll take it, steal it, or push it away, or crush it, or whatever. And then when the papancha, the elaboration starts, it takes over. And basically we become the victim then of that activity. With the sanya and the sankara, we have some input. I can recognize, oh, uh, that's a very attractive clock there. But stealing it is not a very skillful thing to do, so. Yeah. But if, it, if, I, if I aren't really mindful, aren't really attentive to, and don't really have enough wisdom to recognize it, then I'm taken over by it. You know, sometimes the, uh, in the psychology, they talk about people who are emotionally hijacked. They get hijacked by their emotions. They just, I don't know what came over me. I don't know what happened. You know? That's the papancha speaking, just took them over. And they're spun out of control and they lose, they lose control of themselves. So there is that possibility that happens, you see. So if we aren't aware of this perceptual process, we don't know where we have a possibility to, to exert some effort, do something about it. That's why, you know, being aware of the perceptual process of the sense organs, sense process is very, very helpful, very important. And most people, it's their primary source of identification. When there is seeing a sight, you know, this little voice coming up, saying, coming up in your mind saying, oh, I see. Where'd that come from? There is physical organ, your eye. There is the object that's function. And the little voice says, oh, I, not this I. I, me, see. Where did that come from? That's not a natural function of the mind. <laughs> That's your projection into it. <laughs> Seeing is happening, but you are extra. The seer is extra. They're just seeing. It's all that's happening in the brain. <clears> then <throat> we add that to it. We add this extra perception to it, extra cognition. I am seeing. And what I see is right. Yeah. But if you investigate the nature of the sense perceptions, you acknowledge sometimes that what you see many times is not even the clear picture, not even the right picture. It's all distorted. You know, like, like, like just the, well, it was last year, I guess it was. You know, I had drove, I was driven down to, to Melbourne for two days. He went down to Melbourne and back again, three days actually. We came back here and I said to the driver, oh, you know, we, we have, he said, I said something about, oh, the white car. He said, white? The car's not white. The car's silver. I said, no, no, it's white. He said, no, no, it's silver. So we've been driving in this car for three days and you don't see that it's a white car? <laughs> <laughs> and he thought it was silver the whole time. <laughs> Turns out it's silver white. <laughs> Seeing it wrong the whole time, you see, and I saw it right. <laughs>
so so don't trust your senses. <laughs> but being way, being based upon being uh, aware of or attentive to the sense, this what they call the sense sense spheres. So there is the the six internal senses and the six external sense objects. You can say. And Buddhism is the mind is the sixth sense, which is a little bit tricky because, you know, just as the, there is, it's, it's said it's, the word uses mano, mano ayatana. So it's only one aspect of the mind because it's a bit hard to, for most people to distinguish the different functions of the mind, you see. But the mind as a sense organ, its object, of course, is thoughts, you know, you, you, you perceive thought, memories, impressions, images, right? Just as your eyes see a physical object, your mind as a, as a sense organ picks up your mental activities. But at the same time, the mind is, has its own, its own perception, its own field of perception, but it's also being aware of sight, sound, smell, taste, touch. That's vinyana. It's not the mano part of the mind, it's, the, it's the, the knowing, the vinyan part of the mind. Then there's the sanya, which is the cognition now, put it all together. I'm, there's a sight, and then there's the, there's a, say there's a thought occurs in the mind. So the mind is aware of the sense organ, aware of a thought, you know, and then there's a feeling about it, and then there is a cognition about it. That's an intelligent thought. That's a stupid thought. That's a thought about this or that. <clears throat> so the mind is, is a few functions going on in, on there, see. But the uh, the sense objects, <clears throat> and you can be aware of them, of the the different five physical senses: eye, ear, nose, tongue, body. Yeah. And there's a mental sense. And to do, uh, the of course the exercises are again similarly to know the sense object, the sense know the sense organ, know the sense object, and know the fetter which can arise. You know, the, the fetter is whatever becomes the, you know, the, the interpretation, they can say, out of it. You know, there is just a, a the, the act of seeing, but then from the perceptual process, then there is, oh, I like it, I don't like it. That, that gets added on to it. That becomes a fetter then. It's not just the seeing anymore. You know, you're seeing something and then applying this, your own perceptions, your own interpretation, your own preferences to it now. It's beautiful. I like it. I want it. That's all, that's all extra now. But if you put your awareness, attentiveness to a sense organ, sometimes you can see that. Just bubble or pretty quickly happening. Most of the time, we don't even know that and just don't forget, oh, it's just a sense impression. Maybe it was even wrong. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, anyway, there's so many different stories that can be put up. But you know, the, the classical one, of course, around here is you're walking down the road and you see this dark thing on the road. Yeah. yeah. And you're you automatically, you know, there's this feeling up oh, danger. It's, uh, it's not a snake, it's a stick. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so. Maybe you get very you get very angry because it made you made you frightened. You kick it away. <sighs> Hate sticks on the road. <laughs> and I then like for me I just oh firewood. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> Can't burn snakes, but I can burn firewood. So <laughs> so it was a snake I'd kick it off the road. <laughs> no, I would keep keep far away from it myself. <laughs> But it's firewood, I'd go and take it. <laughs> but at the beginning, we don't know. We have misperception. You know? <clears throat> and then you can get a whole range of, you know, like stories can come out of it. You know, <laughs> like, like for some people, they see a stick and it's a snake and they really get frightened and <laughs> they panic, you know, <laughs> because of previous traumas or whatever, you know, <laughs> is there a particular theme or something? You know? <clears throat> The papancha starts, you know, they, they get taken away, they get paralyzed by it, taken over by it. For other people, you know, just, okay, right, 
misperception. That's all okay. I get used to it now. <clears throat> when I was, I was living in Thailand for many years, because I have snake consciousness, see. Then I went to live in New Zealand, you know, and for the first two years of walking around with my torch at night, you know, carefully, because there's lots of grass and it's very dense, dense bush there, looking for snakes, you know. <laughs> really tense, you know. Then I suddenly realized there are no snakes in New Zealand. <laughs> One of the only countries in the world, there's no snakes. What am I doing? <laughs> but it was so, we had, had this you know, preconception, this conditioning to look for snakes, you see. <laughs> but it was just, never even thought about it, never questioned it. <laughs> so then I, then I could relax and turn off my torch even, you know. But then I tripped over the possums, that was the trouble. <laughs> At least they don't, they don't poison his bite. <laughs> it's just a nuisance, so. <laughs> so again, we investigate. Once you notice a particular fetter, then how the unarisen fetter can arise, and how the, the fetter that's already there can be removed, and how the future rising of fetters can be prevented in the future. And of course, one of the, the uh, important uh, Techniques the Buddha gives, of course, is sense restraint. You're, you're aware, you put a, put a guard, they say, a guard over the senses. So you recognize, oh, where these senses go, you know, whatever, whatever sense object you contact, it's a very strong impression in your mind. Yeah, so you begin to recognize that, oh, what's skillful to look at, what's skillful not to look at, so what's unskillful to look at. You know, certain certain colors, for example, I was giving a retreat in Vancouver, and this the center was some kind of international house, I guess it was, and they had around the the room were all these flags from different countries. You know, and I was talking about the sense perceptions here, and I just was using this the different colors of the flags. I can notice, you know, I look at the green color, ooh, pleasant feeling. Red color, unpleasant feeling. Yellow, well, okay, I guess. <laughs> Surprising how many flags are red, yellow, and green. <laughs> Australians don't know that because they don't have it, do they? Just blue and white, isn't it? No, yellow. Huh? Red, blue, and white. Really? <laughs> I didn't look closely. It just looks blue to me. <laughs> But the, the, the stars are yellow, right? Why are they white? White. White. Huh? white? Red, white, and blue. Red. The Union Jack. Red, red. Yeah, the Union blue. Jack. But what, what color are the, flat, uh, the stars? White. The straight up flag is red, yellow, and green. Okay, okay. <laughs> oh, 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 okay. okay. So New Zealand, New Zealand has the yellow stars then. New Zealand has the yellow stars. So he has white stars. Yeah, okay, I got that. <laughs> anyway, yeah. I don't bother looking at them because I'm not an Australian or New Zealander. So anyway, but, <laughs> but I noticed there was, you know, those particular three colors. I, had, you know, when I saw red, unpleasant. It wasn't, it wasn't my favorite color. Then, but green, green, yes, yes. So, so that's why I live in a green place here. Though it's getting a bit drier now, but <laughs> it's greener in New Zealand, but. <laughs> Still green here, <laughs> and uh, and they say that you know for people who have maybe oh better be careful here because <laughs> because certain temperaments of people uh, they they certain colors suit certain temperaments you see see so so people who like uh, there's even some color meditations the forty meditation themes some of them are, are colors what is it there's Red, red, white. I think it's the primary ones. Red, green, and yellow. yellow, and yellow. Blue. No, but but you know, no, no, blue and yellow is green, right? Yes. Yeah. So yeah, blue, colors. yellow, and those four colors. Blue, yellow, and green, red. and red and white. Yeah, four four primary colors. You see. So they, 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 they suit certain temperaments of people too. So for example, you know, if you are, here we go again, 
If you are an anger type, <laughs> then green is a very good color for you. So, oh, does that mean I'm an anger type? Oh, <laughs> if I like green. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> but, uh, but then you can you can observe you know different colors how they affect your mentality or your your state of mind for example you know and also spaces you know some people they they do med the better meditation when they're in a closed space my, others people myself I prefer open space you know for meditation. So, you know, you can recognize the, these are the sense impressions, what the effect they have on your mind, on your psyche, too. And of course, you know, the, uh, the, uh, with, with, with the putting the guard of the sense doors, it's the same with, similarly to uh, regard to the, the sense, of the, uh, the, you know, when we see the different signs, like greed and aversion, you know, the appropriate sign of, of uh, you see things which are attractive, you know, giving appropriate, inappropriate attention to them can give rise to greed. You know, like, you know, there's, there's some of these sense impressions are very, very important to be aware of, be conscious of. Otherwise, you know, we get taken away by them and maybe we don't recognize their effect upon us. But you can control them then if you want. You have some control over them. And the, uh, the second one of these themes, the five groups of grasping, a little bit more complex because they're a little bit more subtle. Five of them are to do with them, or four are to do with the mind, the body, and the four in the mind. And so these are kind of fundamental mental functions. I was just thinking as I walked down here that you know, in the Buddhist time, these were well known, these five groups of grasping. You know, the four mental ones are feeling, cognition, or sanya, the sankara which which is the mental activity very simply and then then the knowing consciousness pinyan yeah. those are well known in the buddhist time but these days people recognize them maybe feeling maybe feeling you already covered that one and it's a very strong impression pleasant unpleasant feeling but for for sanya cognition perhaps memory is the most observable one yeah. and then there is sankara which is mental activities, the predominant mental activity is will or volition or intention. It's what creates the world. How many of us can even recognize what volition is? How many of us know what this quality of volition, what we want? Sometimes it manifests as greed, you see, greed or aversion. You know, will can be, I want it, greed, or I don't want it, aversion then. As an activity of will, but it manifests as an emotion, strong emotional reaction. And then vinyana, just knowing, you know, is what's knowing, so vague. Different kinds of knowing, you see. In vinyana, it's just the bare knowing of there is a sense impression. But then there is then there is the, the memory, for example. Oh, that's the clock. Then there is the, the knowing of that, knowing that you know knowing that you've cognized it. Yeah, so there's all kinds of activities in there, but maybe an easier way is just to reflect in your own mind what aspect of your mind do you identify with the most? Hmm? What, what, is the, what is the real you? Yeah. The real you is feeling. You're a feeling person. Identify with feeling. I mean, probably most of us unconsciously identify with feeling. That's why we, we function as our motivating influence in life. What I do, I want to feel good, right? Whatever I'm doing, I want to feel good, pleasant feeling. I don't want to feel unhappy or unpleasant feeling, right? I'll be dead, I'll try the most I can to get away from that. So why, why that's your most, you know, the, the, the main thing you identify with is yourself. I am somebody who doesn't like unpleasant feeling. Well, Join the club, huh? <laughs> a lot of us in that club. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but the point is the identification with it. Identify with that. How successful are you? Can you keep unpleasant feeling away? Huh? How successful are you? I got a whole drawer full of painkillers. So. 
<laughs> Fortunately, I don't like to use them. So <laughs> every day you feel hungry. Every day you feel tired. <laughs> but uh, how successful are we at that? Or maybe the second one is memory. Yeah? If somebody asked you who you are, you go into your memory and think, oh, well, I'm the person who has, you know, done this and done that and got this and that, you know. And, you know. <laughs> or maybe maybe it is will, you know, will, will volition. You know, I, I want something, I want to get it. I have a very strong will person. I'm going to go for it. <clears throat> so anyway, these five groups of grasping, it's very helpful to have them pointed out because most of us can't identify, can't notice them. But the Buddha, with his profound meditation, of course, his profound sati, attentiveness, his concentration, he was able to identify. You know, most of the time it just happens so quickly. He was able to see these different qualities of mind, function of mind, functioning differently, functioning separately. Then he recognized that how much we identify with them as our sense of self. So it would be helpful to, to study them, what they are, because, uh, yeah. Well, the Buddha pointed out that they exist, but how many of us can actually see them directly? So, so we, the instructions are to be able to see what, what they are. What is this, you know, feeling? What is, what is, what is uh, sanya? What is sankara? What is vinyan? How they arise, what they're arising. And such as they're passing away. They rise and they pass, they rise and they pass. To recognize that these things we usually identify with, we can't, because they're just processes, passing processes. I know some people, they may think, okay, right, I understand the Buddha's teaching. I don't have a self, but I am Vijnana. I'm Sankara. <laughs> they're not things, they're just processes. You can't own them, you can't identify with them really, ultimately. They're just processes, they rise and they pass, they rise and they pass. So until we see that, I mean, we're still identifying. It happens so unconsciously, like the body. You know, we, as we investigate the body, we're still, it's our first source of identification versus a physical body. It eats and sleeps as soon as you're born. But to observe it, this body, this, this, physical, this physical organism is arising and passing, arising and passing. If it didn't eat every day, it would pass away. So keep, keep arising into your, if you have food arising into your mouth every day, <laughs> frequently, otherwise you pass away. <clears throat> and then we come to the Four Noble Truths, which is, yeah, of course, we, we're familiar with this, but, you know, the dukkha, unsatisfactoriness, is to be understood. Uh, the cause, ignorance and craving, is to be abandoned. The cessation, knowledge and liberation in the craving is to be realized. And the path of common insight is to be developed. So the Four Noble Truths, we come to the, the very end of it is the path. And the path, of course, is the Eightfold Path. So we come one more to go. Next, next week is uh, Sama Samadhi, right concentration, right collectedness. how you do uh, well, like how would you teach someone to do that? Well, first of all, you have to, probably the easier one is to start off with just the first five. Start off with, with a manageable number, like five. Or you could go through the, the whole body and just try to observe what's, what's more prominent, you know, for aspect. But I mean, there is, starts off with the, the, the external ones first. Hair of the head, hair of the body, nails, teeth, and skin, which is external, which is easy, reasonably easy to, to observe. Then it goes internally. So, yeah, 
you just hard to imagine in, internally what these are, you know. You have to use your imagination or look in an anatomy book or something. Then you try to, to picture it inside. And there, then there is the, the liquid ones, you know. The blood and the sweat and the tears and yeah, blood, blood, sweat, and fat tears. Yeah. Which is even more, you know, well, tears are okay, I guess, you know, notice them. But sweat, yeah, it's okay. Fat. <laughs> Synovic liquid? I don't even know what it is. <laughs> but, it's, but it's important to be able to, to kind of have an experiential impression of it, see, rather than just a conceptual one. See. So you, but you need maybe you need to use a little bit of imagination or concepts to be able to contact it. Like just remembering, you know, hair, the head, hair, the body, nails, teeth, and skin. And then, then okay, now skin. Yeah. I'll try and try and you know try and see that, and try to to now try to get a more direct experience of the skin yeah. yourself. Yeah. Looking at it, and then try to try to actually uh, experience it inside too. You know, so you could see uh, the cool air on the skin, and uh, the flies on the skin, or something rather, or it's warm or it's hot or something. If you want to see the truth, really see what really is, we make doing like a certain degree of samadhi. Yep. Well, yeah, okay, but uh, <clears throat> sometimes they, they go together, see? Yeah, that's right. Like, that's like if, you, if you're trying to focus your attention on a particular object in the body, well, that helps support right. concentration, too. But if, it, if, it, if it's too intellectual, it doesn't quite, your mind, your mind is still thinking, you see. So that's why I say if it goes to an experiential level, I mean, then, it, then it's, it's non-conceptual and then it can quieten the mind. But if some certain parts of the body for different people have more meaning or something, more relevance. <clears throat> and, they can, and it's better to start off with the easy ones first. You know, I don't even know where my spleen is, you know, for example. You know. <laughs> so anyway, they link, you see, real to one of them, they link yeah. the whole body. So like, like something like the heart, for example. I mean, you can you look at an anatomy book and <clears throat> see, see what a heart looks like. <clears throat> then try to, try to not just look at it outside, but then try to sense your heart inside. <clears throat> or your your lungs or something, you know. The, the, you know they're, they're they're more active. The lungs are breathing, heart's beating. I mean, I don't know what what the liver's doing. <laughs> I can't sense my liver or my spleen. <laughs> Let's look at, <laughs> but, but the heart's beating. You know, so there, there's some impression there. <clears throat> lungs are expanding. <clears throat> the blood's flowing in the veins. You know. So you just have to try it out and see what maybe one of them kind of works a bit better than the other ones, you know. And then you know the one I used, which was easy for me, was was teeth. In my my room in Switzerland, I had a mirror in the room, in the bedroom, in the uh, toilet. You see, so I'd, I'd be there brushing my teeth and look at the mirror, and then teeth, brushing teeth, <laughs> and sometimes it was really just. There's teeth there and no nobody, no tiradamo there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and sometimes I got carried away thinking about it. When tiradamo dies, there'll just be teeth left. <laughs> teeth is the last thing to decay, you know. <laughs> and somebody will find it maybe and then <laughs> hopefully not in the same bathroom. <laughs> 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 But you try out, try out some simple ones, and then see if you can re you can get to the experiential part of it, and maybe not try to do all thirty one at once. <laughs> um, my question is: uh, Do you have any tips to on containing your mind during solitary? Containing your mind. Yeah, like you said, 
after joy arises the next stage is you need to containment and oh, yeah, tranquility yeah. tranquility to reach um, equanimity mm -hmm. so when i was on solitary <coughs> there i use like the bones in my body to try to really like like connect to the earth element to the ground but i'm wondering if there's other practical meditative techniques to or tips to bring it in and sort of <coughs> cultivate integration rather than spaciousness. Yeah, well, there, there's tranquility of body, tranquility of mind, too. You know, so, I mean, the, the tranquility of body, I mean, you got to find ways to, you know, you don't, you know, to inhibit the body, but you have to mm -hmm. calm it down, like just going slower, for example, just slowing down movements. Mm -hmm. yeah. and then, of course, the focusing on the breathing is a good exercise to calm down the mind. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then maybe keeping in a you know, less you know, less um, you know, less uh, open physical environment. You know, mm -hmm. you, you can just even just lower your gaze, keep your keep your the sense of the eye sight sight limited, lower your impressions or, or kind of defocus your eyes a bit more so you're not seeing more things. Mm -hmm. As it gets the mind, uh, sometimes it gets restless and starts to look out. Chasing out for things to look at, you see. <clears throat> Living in a quiet place, quieter, try to limit the sense impressions. That'll be the less things to process in your brain, so mm -hmm. that leads to tranquility too. Mm -hmm. yeah. But you, that, was, that was probably helpful to the body sitting there, and mm -hmm. you know, there are some exercises where you try to, to uh, feel the body you know, settled on the earth. Mm -hmm. It's like a, it's like a, uh, a grounding exercise mm -hmm. or standing with your feet on the ground your bare feet you do that already mm -hmm. <laughs> but maybe it's very stimulating walking around here with all the, mm -hmm. all the uh, gum nuts sticking mm -hmm. in your feet mm -hmm. <laughs> this is very calming <laughs> walking on the nice clean sand and then, oh these sharp gum nuts gum nuts right <laughs> Exercise during solitary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. what, what about it? Is that helpful for um, you know, like uh, releasing worry and stuff like that? It can be. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. If you do, if you do things like uh, you know, mindful or attentive yeah. exercises, mindful like yeah. like like Tai Chi and yoga, especially yeah. you know, especially you're supposed to be very uh, mindful of the exercise itself. Oh, right. And then that makes me, you know, if you do it slower too, it'd be able to become aware of uh, mm. the movements, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> then you can slow them down even more. Mm -hmm. Like some of the teachers, they talk about the slow, slow walking exercises and yeah. you will walk very slowly and then you eat very slowly and try and be very mindful, attentive to the, you know, each movement of eating, mm -hmm. tasting and chewing and, you know. Sometimes it can become a little bit too obsessive, mind you, but no. mm -hmm. as long as you don't inhibit or really uh, try to repress your acti acti activity, acti activities. Mm -hmm. But the equanimi equanimity, can you expand it, explain it a bit more? Equanimity. Wow, well, you want the highest one first, huh? Well, I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm really <laughs> learned about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I... <laughs> it's very, very. It's a very refined, one of the most refined uh, mental qualities, equanimity. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you have to be careful that it's, you know, equ equanimity is being equanimous or even-minded with experience. Because mm -hmm. it can be mistaken for indifference. Mm -hmm. You know, you just, you just close your eyes and your ears and like, ah, oh, I'm equanimous. Don't hear anything, don't say anything. Uh, yeah. But that's, that's, you know, that's, that's not, that's indifference, that's not equanimity. Equanimity is being even-minded with stimulation, with the world, with your thoughts, you see. Yeah, well, I couldn't, didn't know what really meant, that's like, you know, so. Also, there's use of this Pali word, Yonishka Manishikai, I don't know. Maybe, uh, that's what? appropriate attention. Uh, sorry? Mm. Appropriate Yonishka, attention. They, speak, they always say this uh, term yeah. when they, when the Sri Lankan Buddhists, when they yeah. preach, Yonishka, <laughs> I can't say it properly. 
Yoniso Manasikara. Yoniso Manasikara. Yeah. Yoniso literally means back to the source, you know, so mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's like, uh, like the being attentive to the very source of the very nature of, of reality. So, you know, being able to see impermanence. That's a Pali word. Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So a attention normally is a very neutral term, you see. Mm -hmm. Attention goes wherever it's directed or attracted, but but the Buddhist emphasis in meditation is appropriate intention is, is really helpful because what you attend to really has a powerful influence on your mind and how your mind reacts or responds to it, you see. So if you do, can do it appropriately, then you don't lose your collectedness, you don't lose your wisdom. You know. It's a very, it's a very, uh, you know, very uh, general term, and it's a bit technical, so it's not. Yeah. You know, we haven't heard it very often. Usually, it's not very mentioned, not mentioned very often, but it's very similar to to sati. Mm -hmm. Say sati, I say, I translate as attentiveness. Yeah. So if you're really attentive, you, know, you can see more clearly the way nature of things, and then you recognize what is appropriate to attend to. Already, sati is, it's a kind of a, a disciplined or or. Uh, an educated attent attention is is attentive to particular themes and in a particular way. See? We give attention to the arising and the passing, mm -hmm. not to the consistency and permanence of things, but to the arising and passing of things. So it's giving special attention, in special ways. Mm -hmm. Where attention normally is pretty neutral and just goes wherever it wants, undisciplined. You know? until you're attentive to this. Yeah. And maybe this is not very wholesome. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. I thought, um, I heard Yoniso Manasikara sometimes translated as uh, a wise consideration. Yeah. Is that something, I don't know, like the way I understood it was, say, I don't know, say you have some unwholesome mind state or something, or way of, way of thinking about something which is increasingly unwholesome. On your mind, then uh, you think about it in a certain way that it will you know, reduce the unwholesome or a bit like reflecting on the, yeah, the impermanences yeah. or the, or, yeah, the unsatisfactory. So, so then you attend to a, a, a wholesome object like, like uh, impermanence, so that's appropriate attention then. It, it, would be, it can be appropriate, wise, thorough. Yeah. There's, there's a, quite a few meanings for Yoni, yoni Soul. Yeah. Can be wise attention or can be a thorough attention too. Mm. That's why I just translate it as appropriate, you know, sort of. Mm. Yeah. So it's got those connotations of appropriate means wise in Buddhism. And, uh, mm. So you would just say like uh, appropriate attentiveness or something like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So you have to know what's appropriate, what's not appropriate too. That's what's <laughs> wisdom, that's wisdom. <laughs> 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 okay, all is clear. Till next week. <laughs>